And welcome back to Jeff Kunange live here at Citizen Television. What an interesting conversation we're having. It's about GMOs. What do you know about GMOs? Well, Professor Richard O'Dwar is here to talk about it. Dr. Roy Mugira, Kipruto Kiro, former agriculture minister and miner also here talking about GMOs. And joining us on Zoom is Dr. Bernard Muya. He's a public health expert. He used to be with the Ministry of Health. Uh, Dr. Muya, let me ask you real quick. When you heard that the ban had been lifted on GMOs, what were your thoughts? Uh, thank you so much for having me, Jeff. Uh, it's unfortunate that I was not able to join you, but I could hear you. I was following the conversation all the way through. Um, I have uh, several issues with uh, removing the restriction about importation, cultivation of, of GMOs. And my basic issue here is what scientific evidence is do we have that we don't have what has been stated by several of us in this conversation, because my big problem is what is the impact of GMOs in human beings? What evidence research have we subjected ourselves to to prove that GMOs cannot cause serious public and medical issues? I have heard several people talking about some years that research has been conducted about the importance of GMOs. Personally, I seriously take issues of biotechnology as a medical doctor seriously. And there is serious room for us to use it for, for food safety and of course, improving the nutritional status of our communities. Okay. But the basic question, Jeff, the basic question, Jeff, have we done any clinical trials? Which trials have we done for us to show that uh, genetically modified foods are safe and not a short-term research? We need a prospective studies, and those studies should be covering throughout the world globally, not in Kenya. And I will use a very simple word. We think globally, act locally. Where in the world have we subjected GMOs to those trials to prove that they cannot affect health of okay. individuals and communities? All right, Dr. Moya, I'll go straight to Professor Richard Odruo. You can answer that question. I can. <clears throat> go on. Clinical trials or impact on human beings? Jeff, I take particular concerns with uh, Dr. Moya's um, actually communication here. Why? Because they have been, the medical doctors, have been prescribing genetically modified insulin even when there was bad. And he's not talking about it. And particularly, Jeff, let me probably expose a little bit about my, uh, you know, my expertise in this medical field. My postdoc was with Pfizer in Sandwich, UK. And it was Pfizer is one of the pharmaceutical companies. And we were making drugs for malaria, sleeping sickness, and research on cancer. So I have a fair understanding of how these things go, goes from preclinical to the, all the phases of clinical trials up to when it is out there. What they don't know is that even GMO, once it is released by this gentleman here, out there, there is post-release monitoring that also happens just the same way it happens in the you know, pharmaceutical world. It does happen. But let me tell you, Jeff, and this is almost hypocritical, because initially, any person who is alive right now and is suffering from diabetes, Jeff, world over, there is no any other source of insulin. All of it is genetically modified from a bacteria E. coli. And how did it happen? Just a little bit of history so that people understand that it's really convenient for a doctor to talk very firmly on GMO while at the same time prescribing and in, you know, GMO insulin and without blinking the eye. This is the thing. Before, when people were diabetic, we used to extract actually insulin from pigs. And what happened that time? Do you know how many pigs we would have killed now if that technology, if GMO technology 
wasn't adopted. <laughs> and what would it, what, what, what would it happen? We will get a chance. What would it happen if, if to the Muslims? Because they won't touch that insulin, however good it is. Now, this is what we did in genetic engineering. We said, Jeff, you are not diabetic. It means your insulin is correct. What is the gene in you? that actually expresses and leads to the production of this right insulin. That is the gene that was specifically picked and cloned into an E. coli. E. coli is already part of the normal flora that we have in our stomach, so it's nothing new. And then you clone that in what we call in the lab expression cassette, transfer it into this E. coli, and tag it so that it excretes it as waste. It doesn't actually know that it's producing insulin for us. Then that is what through industrial biotechnology we purify and then now prescribe. That is GMO, recombinant DNA technology, swiftly. It is the same thing we used recently during the corona. That was RNA's technology. It is still the, the and they were here and they actually supported the whole world. Between red GMO, which is medicine, and uh, apart from the COVID situation where uh, the vaccines were produced too fast, uh, in uh, normal medical facilities or research, before a, a drug is released, it takes about eight years. For GMOs, that does not happen. Oh. So I've talked about red GMO, but there's now green GMO is the agricultural part, which is very controversial and we are against. For health, that okay. is allowed because it takes longer research, eight years. In fact, there was, you see like a, when they do a lab test on, research, on rats, the lifespan of a rat is two years. So there are no clinical trials. I want to Dr. touch, Roy, you, I want you, to touch you, something. Yeah, go, yes. go. <laughs> uh, not going to, to that of the insulin, but um, yeah, I'm a regulator, and therefore I must be seen to be uh, uh, regulating the work that is coming from the labs and that which is coming out, and also addressing the concerns that are coming from, from uh, our colleagues on this other side. Uh, having said that, it is also my duty to point out that which is not correct or that which uh, isn't, is causing a little more confusion. The issue that Anne pointed about the Burkina Faso story, the short, short uh, length of uh, cotton lint, really had nothing to do with the GM, GM technology because the technology that was used for that cotton is the BT cotton to resist uh, the, the, the cotton ballworm. So uh, it was a breeding uh, that had gone wrong. It had nothing to do with the GMO. She spoke about the cost of seeds, which again, uh, Moshimu has pointed to, uh, which I would want to touch on, on a little. Now, um, when you, the, the Burkina Faso people are growing BT cotton, they would uh, reduce the number of sprays for pesticides, which again, uh, Anne is calling chemicals, and you know, there's no uh, category of all chemicals, that GMOs are not produced using chemicals. In fact, the BT cotton will reduce the number of sprays from 12 to only about three, targeting other, other, other pests. And when you pick a, a sprayer, carrying, for example, an organochloride pesticide and spray onto a farm, you will kill the bees, you will kill the ant, you will kill many other insects. But this very specific uh, protein that is produced in the plant targets the very specific pests, the Lepidopteran larvae. So uh, when really a, a statement is made that they are grown using chemicals and more chemicals, that is, that is not true. Oh, okay, what about what about Anne mentioned, cross-pollination, right? The, the, the potential of... Potential, my, you know, if I have a farm here, mm -hmm. a small farmer here who's using GMOs and right next is organic. Isn't there a chance that there will be some cross-pollination? That's right. And that is one of the aspects that we look at when we are assessing environmental safety. We look at the potential of, it is called gene flow, the flow of genes from the, the GM crop to wild or even uh, cultivated relatives. When we roll out the, the release of the GM maize, for example, <clears throat> we will follow it up with monitoring and technology stewardship to ensure that the two are able to coexist in the cropping system. Certainly, as, as Anna has put it, and also Moshimua, um, the cropping system, our cropping system, where you plant beans and, and, and um, pumpkins and maize and stuff on almost the same plot, uh, may present a challenge. And that is where now we would want to roll out this technology 
with the support uh, of uh, extension service, support of technology stewardship, and that is a commitment that has been given uh, by the current government that uh, we want to revitalize the, the extension system in, in, in partnership with the county government. But Mushmua, this matter could go to court, couldn't it? Yep. It might end up in court. It might, might end up in court. And I, I, I just want my two colleagues to the right to understand that we are not raising these concerns because we want to be alarmist. We are raising concerns because many Kenyans are worried. Now, what the doctor in Zoom has asked, and that is the answer that we should be giving him, is that which trials have we done? Clinical Empirically, trials. clinical trials for purposes of obviating any issue of harm to human nature, given the fact that uh, we, we already saying we are unbanning GMOs, we are getting others from outside. I'm happy we've been doing research internally. We want to understand and get the, the landscape of maize, GMO maize, GM, non-GMO maize to see what, what we are talking about. What they are not telling us is that you will need the same challenge, you will face the same challenges with GMO crop as we face challenges with our normal crop. Whether they are not going to plant in Garissa just because there is not enough water. They are not just going to, 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 to allow the field <coughs> to be grown with weeds. And my, my, our major problem has been to manage the weeds. And that's why they were saying GMO is coming to solve that problem because it can, we can use some herbicides which GMO is going to be resistant to. But now they are not telling us Wanjiku has been weeding our farm twice a year. What are you telling her? Is GMO going to solve that problem of weeding? Or is she going to be exposed to the same harmful GMO elements without mitigation? The, the second issue, I want especially the person of uh, biosafety to tell us what have they prepared in terms of the farming community so that we don't take people by surprise. These are challenges that are real. Yeah. For, Prof, let, let's deal with the clinical trials. Any done yet? Um, there are very many ways we deal with GMO production. And if she was talking about eight years, to generate a GM product takes between 12 to 15 years. To test it on humans? Uh, I'm just giving the... And therefore, when they keep thinking that, uh, um, that it's faster, it is not. It takes 12 to 15 years to generate a GM. And before you release that, from the lab, which is contained environment, we check it and get to know it's fine. For that specific trait, and probably, Jeff, let me demystify this GMO. I think in our mind, we are thinking GMO is this thing that will solve every challenge that we have. That is not true. If we want to target a GMO for drought tolerance, then what do we do? Scientists don't come up with DNA that doesn't exist. We only pick what already naturally exists. So there's nothing really new that we are creating in the lab. For instance, if you go to Northeastern, if our problem right now, which we know is drought in Northeastern, and we want animal feed, we first must look at where is the plant, is there any plant currently existing in Northeastern that is tolerating the drought? Then that is where it all starts. And which crop or animal feed do we want to improve? so that it survives there. You see how the thinking starts. Then let's say, for example, it is sisal. You know, it's a little drought tolerant. Then we say, our cows may not probably be eating sisal. So, but we need the gene that makes it drought tolerant. It, it, drought tolerant. it could be the succulents of the leaves or the roots are deeper so it gets a bit of water. You get, those are only two sets of genes. So we don't need the bitterness, we don't need the thorn in the, the sisal. But when you take, say, maize, to cross with sisal, it can't happen naturally. So what this gene, the technology does is to say, this time round, we are dealing with the drought. And if we feel that we also want to deal with the pest at the same time, then we go for the BT, the Bacillus thuringiensis, which is also, interestingly, a soil-borne bacteria that we eat in salads. So when you hear people saying, how oh, it will kill insects, will it kill us? First of all, the alkaline, the gut of the, 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 the insect is alkaline, and that's what actually promotes it to stick, and then it swells, and it can't feed. So what do we do? 
And that's why I agree with them, that when you pick a GMO product, you must ask what is improved in this seed. As it is right now, the government was addressing, has addressed, say, Jeff, if you want to deal with food security, you must look at several things. You must look at the soil, you must look at the seed, then you must look at the market, and then probably the systems for distribution and everything else. If fertilizers are now added, that they are treating the soil. Now you need to treat the seed. So what do you treat in seed? So you choose. Is it the pest that is a problem? Is it the drought that is a problem? Is it the disease like cassava? When you cut it, you find it brown in there. Is it the weeds like striga? They know them. Then we decide. What do we do first? Now we have the technology of picking tolerance for striga. We can cut it and stack, stack them. You stack the drought tolerant, you stack the, you know, the, the, the disease, like the disease tolerance, you stack the pest tolerance, and you can actually transform it once at a go. Then you will be able to have three different traits protected. And where are we getting the genes from? Probably that is what we need to ask. The genes are from already existing things that some of them we eat. So there is not, it doesn't become bad just because you have now moved it in maize. And I gave you an example. If you transform uh, you know, genes from beans because you want the proteins in beans to move into maize, they, naturally we eat them. Only that now at the point when we are transferring these genes, there must be a problem with beans that beans can no longer grow. And we say we still need the proteins. Okay, Dr. That is Bern the thinking. Sure. Dr. Bernard Moya, I'm sure you're listening to this conversation. What are your thoughts right now? I mean, there's, there's, there's still so many unknowns here. Jeff, um, yes, we, 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 look, can I ask a question to, to a lady and gentleman together with yourself? What is the age of humanity? <laughs> a lot of billion years ago. And I think, I think the reason I'm posing that question is there is room for biotechnology to improve food safety and in, increase nutrients. But we seem to be rushing towards a biotechnology which is still young, which can, if it is realized, can cause perhaps serious issues to the health. And I'm just a very simple, I'm just saying something small, simple. Look at what parts of the world they have done as far as GMOs are concerned. Are we in Kenya in a position to say, yes, globally, we have done this, we can see the results, and then the results are good, the impact is marked to humanity, and we use it. Why are we rushing? Biotechnology has got a very strong room in the future to do so much as food issues, food security is concerned. But when you look at issues in our world, particularly in where we are in Kenya, look at the issues. Somebody had just talked about something smart there, about so the socioeconomic issues related to food in Kenya, for, for that matter. I think I've done studies in, I've been in Israel, and I can attest to the fact that it is a desert, but we have seen how Israel produces food to actually feed not only its citizen, but also feed others, even here in Kenya. So my, my question here is, why we have biotechnology which is smart, it's a smart a scientific endeavor? But the question is, why can't we subject it to various scientific research so that when we come out, we come out with something, a product, which will impact positively to humanity instead of Russia, mm. Jeff. Good question, good question. Uh, Dr. Roy, let me ask you that. You can answer that question. Mm -hmm. And also, what Mwishmu had asked, have you sensitized the Kenyan farmer? And what's the rush? What's the rush? Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Jeff. In fact, uh, when uh, the, the applicants, you know, for us, like I said earlier, we regulate. When the applicant is developing the crop, and I want to touch a little on the, uh, what Mashmua said, when you look at the two crops, there is no significant difference. We carry out what is called um, confined field trials, or rather the applicant is asked by ourselves to try it in, in confinement, so that we check to see 
whether it is doing that which they said it will do. We did that for maize at Kiboko. We did that for cotton at, uh, at, um, Moya, in Moya and several other places. There are several uh, locations. Now, after that, uh, when we were carrying out that, because of, I, I want to touch on the sensi sensitization, um, farmers are made to come and see. In fact, in Moya, uh, when uh, the process was going on during the confined field trials, these are very, very controlled with a fence and some trend to make sure that there is no intruders who come into the, the trials. <laughs> uh, people kept looking through and saying, oh, what, what goes on in there? And the curiosity built until they were almost coming in to see what it is. So we invited them, or rather the, the, the Kari, Kari then, Karo, invited them to come on a field day to see the BT cotton vis-a-vis -vis the non-BT cotton. We had to seek for security to ensure that they don't pocket the seeds and run away with them. They said, we have seen this and this, it is good. We want it now. Then we kept telling them, oh, no, 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 this is trials and we, you can't have it. We, they, they wanted to have it. When we did the, the, the Kiboko trials, the, the CFT in Kiboko, the, the, uh, you know, the scientists, when they make the photographs, they put the cobs from the, 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 the BT maize and also the cobs from the non-BT and then make the picture. Farmers, when they saw the size of this and the size of this, in fact, uh, some almost wanted to steal it from, from there. So the farmers out there are looking for solutions. And that uh, trial is one of the ways of sensitization of the farmers. After the CFT, which is enclosed, we conduct what is called national performance trials. The, the varieties that have been genetically modified are grown in various corners of the country where the particular crop grows, uh, in, um, of course, in controlled areas within Karo establishment, and then the, the, the observations are made whether they are actually doing that which is claimed that they will do. After that, Appropriate varieties are identified and they are now released to farmers. We have done that for cotton. We have completed the process for BT maize, maize that is protected against the, the maize stock borer. In fact, everything is done. We were at the point where we were doing documentation to go to cabinet because of the ban. Now with the lifting of the ban, uh, BT maize is the one that can become available uh, anytime once kefis registers the varieties that have been chosen, okay. which will be owned by Caro and produced by any, any company, seed company that uh, Caro will enter agreement with. So uh, these are products by ourselves. We have checked the safety, the, the trials that uh, uh, Prof has talked about, and which I agree again with our colleague who is joining us online, Dr. Dr. Muya, that um, safety assessments, we do it on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, like I said earlier, Jeff, it is difficult to say all oh, these are GMOs. If it is BT maize, we take it through on a case by We check the profile. The, one of the things that we check, we look at the, the chemical composition of the GM maize and the chemical composition of the non-GM maize and compare. We come up with what is called substantial equivalent. And we find that they are substantially equivalent, except for the protein that is being expressed by this, which has been modified. Okay, uh, the question is, why does GMO have such a bad name then? Why? I want to ask you that in general. Mm -hmm. let, let's take a break, quick break and talk about that. You know, yeah. why? Why? How, why? Yeah. Yeah. why? Yeah. That would be. Uh, is, is it uh, pressure from multinationals maybe? Well, is there pressure? And our colleagues should not be defensive. Let us demystify this. Yeah, let's mm. demystify. Yes. I think we I need agree. To, yes. But let's first take a break. Yes. All right. Thank <laughs> what you. are your thoughts? <laughs> Can we demystify GMOs? <laughs> Keep tweeting at Kudanga Jeff at Citizen TV Kenya. The hashtag JK Live. JK Live takes a break. We'll be back in a moment.